Good morning, Evans Bible Fellowship. My name is Jeff Estes. This is my wife, Eileen. Welcome to the EBF Virtual Sunday Gathering. Uh, we're so glad that you joined us this week. Um, if this is your first week with us, uh, welcome. Um, we're going to be going through a call to worship in a minute, and the words will be on the screen. And I'd love for you to read along with me. Uh, it comes from Psalm 104, and this week we're going to be using um, uh, the Message Translation. Uh, which is not something we typically do here, but I love the way the message translates this uh, passage. So if you would read along with me. God, my God, how great you are. Beautifully, gloriously robed, dressed up in sunshine and all heaven stretched out for your tent. You built your palace on the ocean depths, made a chariot out of clouds and took off on the wings of wind. You commandeered winds as messengers, appointed fire and flame as ambassadors. You set, set the earth on a firm foundation so that nothing can shake it, ever. You blanketed the earth with ocean, covered the mountains with deep waters. Then you roared, and the water ran away. Your thunder crash put it to flight. Mountains pushed up, valleys spread out in the places you assigned them. You set boundaries between earth and sea. Never again will the earth be flooded. You started the springs and rivers, sent them flowing among the hills. And the wild animals now drink their fill. Wild donkeys quench their thirst. Along the riverbanks, the birds build nests. Ravens make their voices heard. You water the mountains from your heavenly cisterns. Earth is supplied with plenty of water. You make grass grow for the livestock and hay for the animals that plow the ground. Amen. This is the same God who we worship today, who is sovereign over all things. He is amazing and worthy of our praises. Would you sing along with us? Amazing. 
have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open. of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is called Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open. out oh what a savior
Good morning, EBF kids and families. I'm excited to be with you guys again today. Today we're gonna be learning about the beginning of King David's life before he was a king. But before we do that, last week we learned about Joshua in the wall or in the city of Jericho and the Lord giving him the strength and the power to lead the people um, to then conquer Jericho. And I challenged you to memorize a verse, Joshua 1, 9. So if you memorized it, let's say it all together. All right, ready? One, two, three. Joshua 1, 9. Haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. All right, good job if you memorized it. If not, we'll have another opportunity at the end of this video. But today we're going to jump into um, the story from the Jesus Storybook Bible, the chapter called The Teeny Weeny True King, all right? And it is on page 116. So if you want to follow along, you can go and grab your um, Bible like this, your Jesus Storybook Bible, and you can follow along with us, all right? And then I'll come back at the end and ask you guys some questions. All right, I'll see you in a minute. The Teeny Weeny True King God's people had a new land. Now they wanted a king. But God is your king, Samuel told them. He is the one who looks after you best. But we want a real king, they said. One we can see. God knew that a king might not be kind to his people or look after them as well as he would. But God's people didn't care. They wanted a king and they wanted him now. So God gave them a king. He was called Saul and he seemed like a good king at first, but he became proud and stopped listening to God. He didn't obey God or love God with his whole heart. Saul can't help me with my plan, God said. I need a king who loves me and will teach my people to love me. I need a true king. God had just the one in mind. Go to Bethlehem, God told Samuel. You'll find the new king there. Samuel's job was to listen to God and tell people what God said. So Samuel went to the little town of Bethlehem. God told Samuel to go to Jesse's house. God was going to choose one of Jesse's sons to be the new king. Jesse had seven strong sons. Now in those days, if you were going to be the king, you didn't have to be the richest or the cleverest, although that was always nice. You had to look like a king, which meant you had to be the tallest and the strongest so you could carry the longest swords and biggest armour and defeat everyone. And it didn't hurt to be handsome either. Samuel asked Jesse to bring him each son in turn. So Jesse brought the oldest, tallest, strongest son. Oh, well, this must be the new king, Samuel thought. He looks like a king, but God didn't choose him. You're thinking about what he looks like on the outside, God told Samuel but I'm looking at his heart, what he's like on the inside. So Jesse showed Samuel his next oldest, tallest, strongest son. But God didn't choose him either. In fact, God didn't choose any of the seven sons. Samuel said, is that all? Jesse laughed. Oh, well, there's the youngest one, but he's just the weakling of the family. He's only teeny. Bring him said Samuel. Jesse's youngest son came running up and God spoke quietly to Samuel. This is the one. His name was David. He has a heart like mine, God said. It is full of love. He will help me with my secret rescue plan. And one of his children's children's children will be the king. And that king will rule the world forever. 
Samuel anointed David's head with oil, which was a special way to show that you are God's chosen king. You will be the new king one day, Samuel told him. And sure enough, when he grew up, David became king. God chose David to be king because God was getting his people ready for an even greater king who was coming. Once again, God would say, Go to Bethlehem. You'll find the new king there. And there, one starry night in Bethlehem, in the town of David, three wise men would find him. Okay, welcome back. In this story, God shows up in a weird way. You would expect that the king of Israel would be a really tall, strong person who could go into wars and fight battles, but that's not what God wanted from a king. So my question for you to discuss with, discuss with your families is what does um, God look for, or what did God look for in the next king of Israel? And what does God look for now in his people? If you are a believer, you are one of his children. And what does God want and desire from us? And then after you talk about that with your families, then you can work on a verse to memorize. And that verse this week is going to be Psalms 86, 11. And it says, Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. Because that's what David did. He said, he, he, this is what he said. This was his prayer to the Lord. Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. And then, so once you work on that with your family and talk about um, the discussion question, then you guys can all pray together. And you can pray and ask God to give you an undivided mind. That means that you aren't wanting to love or worship something else. Under, if you divide something, that means you're splitting it in two. Just like I am splitting this book into two parts. I'm dividing it. But God wants us to have a whole heart for him, a whole heart, not divided, all right? So you can pray and ask God to give you a whole heart devoted to him um, and an undivided mind to fear his name. All right, I hope you guys have a good week and I'll see you back here next week. Bye. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Acts. Chapter 19, verses 11 to 20. Please turn there now in your Bibles and read along with me. Acts 19, 11 to 20. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all, and they were and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded this became known to all the residents of ephesus both jews and greeks and fear fell upon them all and the name of the lord jesus was extolled also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices and a number of those who had practiced magical arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Greetings, EBF family, and it's a joy to be with you here this morning. My name is Tim, and the, that longed-for, anticipated day is finally here. Myself and our family are, are in the Evanston area, and we're so grateful for your prayer, your support, your encouragement along the way, and for your help in moving us in as well. We look forward to setting down roots and uh, are praying about what is next for our church family and would, and would invite your prayer along those same lines as well. After our service here, actually as a continuation of worship, we look forward to celebrating communion together. So we would invite you to stick around for that as we come to the Lord's table together, a, a beautiful picture of our, of our unity in Christ, and celebrate all that Jesus has endured for you and for me. Eileen, thank you for reading our passage here this morning. And if you haven't already, I invite you to turn to Acts 19, verses 11 through 20. We are in a series in these three chapters here in Acts, Acts 18 through 20, exploring the birth of the church in Ephesus in a series we're calling God's Gracious Gospel. That great sweeping theme of the book of Acts really is about the advancement of the unstoppable gospel of God through his faithful witnesses, empowered by the Holy Spirit, all according to the plan of God. And then Acts 1.8, in many ways, provides the structure to the book as a whole, and you will receive power, chapters 1 through 2, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, chapters 3 through 5, in all Judea and Samaria, chapters 6 through 12, and then to the ends of the earth, chapters 13 through 28. So here we find ourselves in what is the last section in Acts, and in particular in Paul's third missionary journey, a journey that began in chapter 18, verse 23. And last week in Acts 19, 1 through 10, we explored how the Apostle Paul engaged three types of potential disciples with God's gospel, how he engaged those who were religious, those who were hostile, and those who were curious as well. And the bottom line was that we need spirit-empowered disciple makers who display orthodoxy, orthopraxy, and orthopathy to engage all types of people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, regardless of their background, regardless of the setting, regardless of how we perceive they may respond to the gospel, all till the church is built and the earth is filled with God's glory. So today we turn our attention then to this next collection of stories in Acts 19, 11 through 20, and these reveal even more about the birth of the church in Ephesus. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for your life-giving word, which provides an anchor in the midst of tumultuous times. Father, we ask for hope in a time of hopelessness. Lord, would you encourage and provide solace and hope for us who may face weariness in our souls. God, would we hear your word? Would it would it sink down deep within us? Would it transform us from the inside out? Inspire us with the birth of this dear church. And show us how you would have us move forward as a church as well. In Jesus' precious and matchless holy name, amen. What are some of the ways that we talk about power today? You might think of, actually for me, in hooking up the utilities to our new place, I had to contact the power company. Or you might think about the Hawks scoring a power play goal. You might talk about how power, in certain conversations, we talk about power as influence. Or we might talk about even calling out abuses to power when we're confronted with those. Well, what does Scripture have to say about power? In particular, supernatural power. And that's what we come face to face with here in Acts 19, 11 through 20. In our time together this morning, we're going to explore five what we might call power encounters. Power encounters. As the power of the triune, living, and holy God confronts a city that was enmeshed in magic and was preoccupied with the occult. This city of Ephesus here in the first century. And so let's dive in, beginning with that first encounter in verses 11 through 12, what we might call God's miraculous power. The story begins with an undeniable demonstration of God's miraculous power. Follow along with me. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. 
right away we're confronted with what is kind of a peculiar passage. We're, we get the feeling that these stories are going to be unlike maybe typical stories that we encounter. But Luke, the author here, is keen on showing us that these events that took place in Ephesus were not merely miracles. He actually adds the word extraordinary to them, extraordinary miracles, that these are not even typical for miracles themselves. The word for handkerchief has to do with a, a face cloth that is used to wipe away sweat. You might think today of like a sweatband or a, a sweat rag. I know often when I'm wearing a suit, yeah, it's hard to picture me in a suit maybe, but often when I'm wearing one, I, I have a sweat you know, handkerchief along with me as well. Or the word apron, for instance, has to do with a covering that was tied around the, the waist of a worker. So think of a modern welder wearing a leather apron while he works. These were normal implements of Paul's work. And these items were taken by believers to those that were sick. And with the result that people were healed of their diseases and demons were powerfully driven out. You know how we react to this text or how people have reacted to this text can fall on two extremes. One might be to deny the miraculous, say that things like this never took place or to try to minimize them in some way. The other extreme might be to actually try to, try to mimic these miracles. You think of religious hucksters, those that are hawking their wares, perhaps on as televangelists, you know, be it holy water or maybe even literally handkerchiefs that they're trying to, trying to sell to, to, uh, to people on TV. You know, when I was in my undergrad, I took a sociology class on white-collar crime. And sadly, there was an entire section of that class devoted to religious fraud. And I remember that sinking feeling in my own heart, surrounded by many that don't know Christ, becoming confronted with the ways in which people have engaged in religious fraud or have used or abused the name of Jesus in order to make a buck. But Paul wasn't the one selling these things or even telling people that they needed to, that they needed to do these things. Nor was the healing power found in the objects themselves. No, the text is very clear on saying that it was God. God was the one doing these things. God was the one healing people. And he used Paul as his instrument. He used Paul as his chosen vessel to do so. Luke, in, Luke states emphatically that it was God who was doing it. And what's more, these miracles then paved the way for the hearing of the gospel, and they also confirm that God is working through Paul. They were part of his credentials, you might say, as an apostle. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, Paul writes, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. This is how God chose to reveal himself in a city that was steeped in superstition and mired in magic. He revealed himself, he revealed his sovereign power in a way that would have captured their attention and would have drawn them to Jesus. It even led, as we're going to see, to some of the Ephesians overcoming their magic and superstition and responding to God's gospel. And so it begs the question, what is our response to a text like this? Should we, EBF, should we start a miracle sweatband ministry? Should we sell them on Etsy? I don't think so. <laughs> Just tell you right off the bat, I don't think so. But, dear church, God is still in the business of doing extraordinary miracles today. And the greatest miracle of all is the miracle of new birth. God powerfully raised Jesus from the dead, and all who are in Christ receive new resurrection life that starts now and lasts for all eternity. So let us trust in our miracle-working God. And yes, pray for healing along the lines of, say, James chapter 5. He may, he may very well choose to reveal himself in that way. And let us trust God when he doesn't heal in the way that maybe we might draw it up or the way that we might expect. Let us rest in his goodness, his sovereignty, and his faithfulness. This power encounter, though, should also lead us to analyze our own culture, the culture surrounding us, to, to think about what are the things, what are the, what are the obstacles to the furtherance of the gospel in our culture? 
but along similar lines, what are the commonalities? What are the aspects of culture that might make people actually more receptive to the gospel around us? What are those connection points that we have with people in the culture surrounding us that may be good gospel uh, connection points? So we can all breathe a sigh of relief. No Miracle Sweatband Ministry will be endorsed by AVF, but here's the second power encounter. We might call this one an attempted hijacking of power. Look at verses 13 through 16. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Again, the stories get a little bit even more peculiar as we go here, but itinerant Jewish exorcists, that, that would make a great band name, by the way. These are individuals who wanted to bottle up this power and use it for their own benefit. They saw Paul's ministry and wanted to cash in on the name of Jesus. Now remember again, Ephesus in the first century had a reputation for being a center of magic. And many felt the need for, to guard themselves or to be protected from evil spirits. Ephesus also experienced a great deal of what we might call syncretism. That is, combining of different religious beliefs. And so, here it was the combining of Judaism with pagan practices and magic. And these Jewish exorcists were then known because of their strange Hebrew spells. And so, work in this field actually was quite lucrative. So, Jewish and pagan exorcists tried to use whatever spells, whatever potions, whatever magic objects seemed to work. It was like throwing things at the wall and trying to see what sticks. And so as the power of the gospel became known, they attempted to hijack the powerful name of Jesus. They wanted to add Jesus to the mix, like picture Ursula, you know, in The Little Mermaid, adding things to the pot. That's what they attempt to do here. But what they didn't realize is that the key is not simply knowing the name of Jesus. James 2.19 reminds us that even the demons believe and shudder. No, the key is actually knowing Jesus and being known by him. Knowing Jesus and being known by him. Another clue I think here is in looking at kind of the roundabout way that they use the name of Jesus. It reveals their true distance from him. When it says, when they say, I adjure you by the Jesus Paul proclaims. Anytime you use the phrase, the Jesus, <laughs> you can kind of sense that they have some distance. They have some unfamiliarity with him. It's not entirely clear who this Sceva guy was, by the way, or, or how even he gained the title of high priest. It could very well be that this was a, a title that he gave himself. And if, if quotation marks had been available to Luke, I, I wonder if he would have used him here, saying this high priest or maybe self-proclaimed high priest. It reminds me of, you know, modern day quacks that use the title doctor. But these, these evils... The evil spirit's response, too, I think, is insightful. Look at what the evil spirit says. Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? <laughs> Jesus' name was well known to the demon they were trying to cast out. It became clear that they had no right to use this name. What results we could call a reverse exorcism. He overpowers them. I think that's a very carefully chosen word. He overpowers them, strips them naked, and leaves them bleeding and humiliated, humiliated as they run from there. Matt Chandler writes about this. He says, if when the fight started you were wearing pants, and when it was over you were no longer wearing pants, you lost. And I think that's an accurate sentiment. You know, it made me think about my time in the Army, and in particular receiving extensive training uh, regarding weapons, so gaining knowledge, experience, proficiency, and familiar, familiarity. And here, it's as if they try to wield Jesus' name like an unfamiliar weapon. They have no knowledge, no experience, no familiarity, and needless to say, it blows up on them. 
church, we too must be aware of the danger of syncretism. Today, not only in our lives, in our families, but in the church as well. It, makes us, it should cause us to ask, what other pagan or religious practices do we allow to creep in? Creep into our own lives, as I mentioned, to creep into our families or to creep into the church. We too must be aware of the reality and influence of Satan and evil. We, we should have nothing to do with these things. But even they know the power that Jesus has over them. And so Jesus is not some spiritual power that we can bottle up, that we can control, or we can manipulate. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the sovereign Lord who demands our worship and our service, our wholehearted worship and our open-handed service. And so the residents of Ephesus here recognize Jesus' true power and come to exalt him as a result. Look at verse 17. The third power encounter here is the true source of power. Look at verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Word of what happened here to actually how Alistair Begg calls them the seven streakers of Sceva. I kind of like that. It has a ring to it. But word of what happens to them spread like wildfire. And this word even crossed racial and ethnic lines as both Jews and Greeks heard about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the result is that a reverent fear of Jesus, the true source of power, fell upon them. And what's more, the name of the Lord Jesus was lifted up. They went from invoking the name of Jesus fraudulently to extolling the name of Jesus fearfully. And so it should force us to ask the question, have we lost our sense of the holiness of Christ? Sometimes even in evangelical circles, we can emphasize that Jesus is our friend. Well, that's right and good. But sometimes it can almost feel like he's, our, he's a teddy bear to squeeze. But have we lost this sense of holiness? Have we, do we approach him in reverence and awe rendering, giving him the honor and glory that is due to him and him alone. This reverence for Christ is picked up in Ephesians 5 verse 21 and forms the foundation for our submission toward one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This then leads to some of the Ephesian believers pressing even more deeply into the power of the gospel. Look at the the fourth power encounter, what we might call the forfeiting of, of magical power, verses 18 and 19. And many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought, brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them it, and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. In just these two short verses here, we are given a powerful picture of confession and repentance. Here are some who were already believers within the Ephesian church, those that had already joined this new community of disciples, who felt then the conviction of the Holy Spirit and renounced their former way of life even more. It is worth noting that these were not requirements that were placed on them prior to conversion. Instead, during their discipleship, they became even more sensitized to sin. Today, we might talk about becoming desensitized as it relates to maybe things like uh, violence in movies or something along those lines, but they become even more sensitized to their sin, are convicted, and give up their former way of life. F.F. Bruce writes about this scene. He writes, according to magical theory, the potency of a spell is bound up, bound up with its secrecy. If it be divulged, it becomes ineffective. So these converted magicians renounced their imagined power, their imagined power, I love that, by rendering their spells inoperative. In the first century, again, magic scrolls were, were actually known as Ephesian letters. That's how bound up Ephesus was with or had the reputation of being a center of magic in the occult that these scrolls, these books, were literally called Ephesian writings, Ephesian letters. It actually, I think, 
peels back the layer a little bit and helps us understand how when Paul then writes to the church in Ephesus, he does so against the backdrop of rulers, authorities, powers, and spiritual forces. We see that play out again and again in Ephesians and more than any of his other letters. But there are a number of observations though that stand out just from these two short verses. First is that these new believers had practiced magic arts, but they were still holding on to these valuable scrolls. In their conviction, they brought their books forward. They brought them as a communal act of repentance. They were willing to destroy them by fire, repudiating and renouncing the contents of those books. And they did so publicly as a witness to the, the, the surrounding community of the, the true wonder-working God. And they did so at great economic loss to themselves. 50,000 pieces of silver would be the equivalent of approximately 135 years of wages. Not only did they do so at great economic loss to themselves, but they could have made quite a profit selling these things. Instead, they didn't want anyone else to be subject to these kinds of resources. And so they burned these contents. This all signaled the genuineness of their faith, God working to transform their lives, and even in a greater trust in God as they continued to grow in their maturity in Christ. You know, there's a wonderful painting by the French painter Le Sueur from 1649 called The Sermon of St. Paul at Ephesus. I think it's in the Louvre now, but... In it, the Apostle Paul is pictured proclaiming the gospel to the crowd. And if you look at the bottom of the painting, there are those that are bringing forward these magical scrolls, these magical books, and one is even beginning to kindle the fire, beginning to light them on fire. It's a powerful picture of repentance. So church, there are, are, it's important for us to recognize how there are aspects of our discipleship that must not become what we might call requirements to conversion. These new believers did not give up these practices before coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Instead, as they matured in their walk, in their walk they were convicted even more, and they came to renounce their former way of life, as God did that convicting work. We too should not expect people to fit a certain mold or have everything together before they come to faith in Jesus Christ, to have dotted every I and crossed every T. Through discipleship, new believers become similar to these individuals. They become more sensitized to sin and engaged in confession and repentance. That is what we are called to do more and more along the way in our faith, to continuously confess and to repent. And so it begs the question, what is God calling you to repent of? What is he calling me to confess and to repent of? What do you need to give up? What do you need a radical break from like these individuals here in Acts? If the conviction of the Holy Spirit swept through our church, what would be burned? What subscriptions would be canceled? What objects would need to be done away with? What internet histories would be revealed? May the Spirit of God affect such a deep change in our hearts. May we confess sin, bring it into the open, and render it powerless. And may we forsake ungodly practices, reject all rivals, and revere Christ alone, who gave himself for us. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's now turn then to that final power encounter. The final one there in verse 20. Verse 20 says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. What an amazing summary. The phrase actually prevail mightily here is literally grow in power. The word of the Lord is personified here as growing in its power and prevailing. You know, this is a repeated act or repeated idea in the book of Acts. Luke gives several what we might call progress reports along the way that reveals the gospel triumphing, triumphing over all earthly powers, 
transforming people's lives, transforming cities, transforming entire regions. It connects with the broader theme of Acts, that of the advancement of the unstoppable gospel of God. And in fact, the word of the Lord then brackets this entire passage. If you look back at verse 10, it says, This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And then to verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. This would become the emphasis of Paul's entire ministry in Ephesus. The proclamation, the heralding of the powerful word of God. So if we too want to see entire cities and regions transformed, we need to proclaim and practice the word of truth, the gospel. I'm not talking, though, merely about preaching sermons, as important as that, as that may be. It's about believers who experience, who have themselves experienced the gospel's transforming power, meeting Christ in his word, and introducing others to the Christ of the word. A passage such as this should increase our confidence in the conquering power of the proclaimed word. So let us meet Christ in his word and help others meet Christ through his word in our worship gatherings, in our ethos communities, in our one-to-one -one discipleship, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our homes, and more. Church, here's the bottom line. Kind of trying to bring it all together here for us. Jesus is not some spiritual power we can bottle up, control, or manipulate. He is the risen Savior and sovereign Lord. We should worship wholeheartedly and serve open-handedly. Think about the Gospels and the portrait that is painted of Jesus in the Gospels. And actually, there are commonalities almost with each one of these power encounters with aspects of Jesus' life and ministry. Jesus' power healed the woman who touched the very fringes fringe of his garment when no one else could heal her. Jesus powerfully delivered a man from a legion of demons and a life as an outcast that had left him and then left him after driving out those demons, left him dressed and in his right mind. In contrast to these seven exorcists who are overpowered by a single demon and leave themselves, leave naked and shamed. When the people saw this in Luke's gospel, for instance, when they saw Jesus powerfully de deliver this man from a legion of demons, how did they respond? It said they were gripped with fear. A day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus calls us then to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him in the costly way of discipleship, knowing that along the way, we are being conformed more and more into the image of Christ. And it is his word that continues to grow in power and to prevail. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Jesus is not some spiritual power that we can bottle up, that we can control, that we can, or that we can manipulate. He is the risen Savior and the sovereign Lord that we must worship wholeheartedly and serve open-handedly. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for the great cloud of witnesses that we are surrounded by. And we ask for your divine help through your spirit to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run, O oh Lord, with endurance, the race that you have set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. O oh God, we praise you for your sovereign power. We praise you for all that you have done in and through your Son. We ask that you might Reveal to us even more the depths of our own sin. May we confess, may we repent, and may we cling to you, ultimately looking to you. And would you find us faithful to this task too of taking the transformational power of the gospel forward 
to all those who need it so desperately. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' powerful, powerful, matchless name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Tim, for that message. In, in response to Pastor Tim's message this morning, uh, I want to give us some space and time as we prepare to receive communion together. Um, just to, pre to prepare your heart and to search your heart and to inspect and um, see if there's anything that is hidden that should not be there. See if you are keeping something from somebody or um, see if you are uh, keeping things from trying or you're trying to hide things from the Holy Spirit. Um, remember, he knows all things. So I'm just going to give you just a, a couple of seconds um, and then we're going to sing and we're going to continue worshiping and then um, we'll take communion together.
His power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Before we close our service this morning with announcements, I want to transition to a time of taking up this morning's offering. In 1 Chronicles 29.9, the Israelites are, are taking up an offering for the temple. And after the people gave their gifts in, a, in what's called a free will offering, it says, quote, then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly. For with a whole heart, they had offered freely to the Lord. What a joy it is to freely give towards the work the Lord is doing in our church. To offer him thanks and worship with our whole hearts and completely willingly. If you call EBF your church home, I want to invite you to prayerfully give with generosity and joy in your hearts out of a desire to worship the Lord wholeheartedly. We have a few ways to give right now. Um, I won't run through all, all the details this week, um, but they're on the bottom of your screen for you. Um, but you can give by mail, you can give online, and you can also give via text. And I pray that as you give this morning, it will lead you to rejoice like the Israelites in 1 Chronicles 29. Now I have a few announcements about things going on in the life of our church. Um, the first announcement is a quick reminder that we will be having a members meeting via Zoom on October 24th at 9.30 a.m. So mark your calendars and plan to join us. In the coming weeks, we're going to be sharing the Zoom link in the weekend update email, so you can be on the lookout for that. The second announcement is that we have a new event coming up thanks to our wonderful community team that is called The Table. As a church, we want to continue creating avenues for the body of Christ to connect with one another and get to know each other. And, and we really hope that this event will help serve that purpose of building up our community. It's going to start at 8 p.m. on October 17th, and it will take place on Zoom. We're going to do some creative things as a big group. We're going to um, do some things in breakout groups. And I think it will just be a really refreshing time to, to see one another and to see others outside of maybe your normal circle of community. So the link to join that Zoom call is in the weekend update email this week, and it's going to be sent out again next Saturday morning as well. And then finally, the third announcement is that we are having a time of communion and prayer today after the service as an entire church family on Zoom. So at 11.30 a.m., join us by clicking the Zoom link that's in the video description and you can also find the Zoom link in the weekend update and the Sunday service emails as well. So here's how this will work after the service ends. Uh, gather your communion supplies and then just go right ahead and, and jump on the Zoom call, even if you're a little early. Um, if you, and if you don't have communion supplies, still feel free to join us um, as we spend time celebrating the unity that we have in Christ through the Lord's Supper. I want to encourage you all to, to keep your videos on during that call so that we can see one another as we remember the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So once again, that will begin at 11.30 a.m. And you can join by clicking the Zoom link in the video description. So that's all for the announcements. We uh, will be actually giving the benediction after the time of communion and prayer. So I hope to see you there.